At its very core, drug science must remain independent. This means we don't accept sponsorships. It's with the support of the drug science community we're able to do this and make the podcast in the first place. If you're able to become a drug science community member and support the show, you too will be supporting the dissemination of evidence-based drug policies. Without you, none of this would be possible. For anybody interested, there's a link in the show notes. Thank you. Hello and welcome to the Drug Science Podcast with me, David Nutt. Here we're bringing together experts and activists for a rational, honest and informed conversation about drugs. A Fascinate Productions podcast for drug science. Hello, I'm David Nutt and welcome to this Drug Science podcast. My guest tonight is Johan Hari, a journalist and writer whose book, Chasing the Scream, I think is the best book ever written about the drug laws, the politics behind them, and particularly the impact they have on humans. So you're going to find this a a roller coaster of an interview, but I'm sure you'll enjoy it. Oh, David, I feel slightly ridiculous doing this because so much of what I'm going to say and what I know, I learned from you. So it's a slightly bizarre situation when you're going to ask me questions, I'm going to explain your own thoughts back to you. No, you're not. Because your book is (laughs) remarkable. And and what I really liked about your book was the way it's written. Each chapter is about a person. And I'm a scientist and I, you know, to me, people are just numbers in a statistical map. But for you, (laughs) the the people were the key to it. And and that's why it's such a powerful book. So so why did you do that? But you know, David, I think you're doing yourself down there. I just wanted to say, and I hope your producer doesn't cut this out, you know, you and I met, I don't know if you remember this, the very first time we met was in the Newsnight studio and it was the night you resigned, right? Or that absurd situation where you were kind of forced to. And I remember it so vividly because I had known your work and admired you before that. And I remember I was on Newsnight to talk about something else that night. And I remember in that kind of maelstrom thinking, God, you know, this is this is a really tough situation for someone to be put in. Although you were completely right and were entirely vindicated and, you know, you were fired for pointing out objective scientific facts. So I always thought it's a great, uh, I mean, it was a terrible thing that happened to you, but it's a, a, a really profound parable about the madness of our drug policies that stating an undeniable fact that no one all the way through that controversy ever disputed was true, right? Led to you being fired. But I remember thinking then, God, this is going to be really hard for this guy. And then in the, you know, the years that followed when I was researching the drug war and uh, both when I was writing Chasing the Scream and then in the years afterwards when I've been kind of in different places talking about it, the number of people who've talked to me about how you have helped them and the work you've done from South Africa to Mexico City to Australia, I mean, people talking about this and and what you've done. And actually, you're so much more valuable to us now than you ever were as a government advisor. And so I just wanted to thank you for what you've done. And I think you're doing yourself down saying this is a statistical thing for you. You would not have inspired all those people I've met all over the world if you didn't have a very keen sense of human liberation, liberatory potential and the pain that's inflicted on people by these crazy policies. So I think you're being a bit, <laughs> I understand what you're saying, but. Well, I think the great, and this is interesting, you know, so we, we've come to it from the two ends and, you, you know, we can see it in the round now. And I think what your book does remarkably is capture the human pain of the drug war. So let me ask you that question again. Why did you, why did you want to write that book? Well, for me, it was very personal and I had a very particular way into this debate. I think it's important to stress it's just one way into this debate. So for me, we had addiction in my family. One of my earliest memories is of trying to wake up one of my relatives and not being able to. And I didn't I didn't understand why at the time because I was too small. But as I got older, I realised we had drug addiction in my family. In fact, still do. And I think for me, when I started working on Chasing the Screen, which must be a little bit less than nine years ago, I just didn't know what to do. You know, I, I had always been sceptical of the drug war for as long as I can remember, but I didn't know what to do. And I wanted to kind of try to understand, well, how did we get to this point where we were punishing people like the people I love? What has been tried that doesn't work? What has been tried that does work? And so, as you know, I ended up going on this mad kind of journey. When I started on it, I had no idea it would be as big or as epic a journey as it became. But I got to know a crazy mixture of people from a, you know, a trans crack dealer in Brooklyn, (laughs) who's one of the smartest people I know to... Uh, hitman for the deadliest Mexican drug cartel. He's he's not one of the smartest people I know. To, you know, the only country that's 
decriminalized all drugs so far with incredible results. So for me, it was a very personal journey with that very strong motive about, okay, why are we doing this to people with addiction problems and what can we do about that? But obviously in the course of that journey and putting together that story of how did we begin this war? Why does it continue? Obviously I learned... And I had known these to some degree before, but I learned a lot more about different angles. So the liberatory potential for some people of drug use, which is obviously very, is actually the the norm, the pleasurable use, um, and addiction is the outlier. And, you know, questions about racism around the drug war, which are very extreme and obviously very much on our minds quite rightly at the moment. It should be on our minds a lot more. And the violence caused by prohibition, which again, which actually I think is the single biggest moral issue surrounding this war. So I learned a huge amount more, but that was my kind of path in. That was my way, my, the reason I cared at first. But it was a huge undertaking. I mean, and you could have died at many points on the road. <laughs> <laughs> it was funny. I remember when I this actually wasn't the day most dangerous moment, but it was the a moment when I became, I thought in a comical way about danger. So when I went to interview Rosalio Retta in prison, he's the Mexican, uh, he, so between the ages of 14 and 17, he butchered or beheaded about 70 people. And I remember going in to see him in the prison guard was, people can listen to the audio of this actually on the Chasing the Screen website. I remember going in and the prison guard saying, well, obviously we can't leave you alone with him. He's like, butchered 70 people and I said oh thanks that's that's great I said so don't worry we'll stay with you and about 10 minutes into our conversation I turned around and they'd fucking left me I was on my own with them actually he was quite weedy and um, I wasn't particularly uh funny enough he had these big Deirdre Barlow glasses and so the evocation of Deirdre Barlow alongside Mexican beheading drug gangs it somewhat punctured the danger for me there were moments where I didn't I didn't feel so much frightened for myself as you were witnessing just monstrous acts against other people. So, you know, in Arizona, I went out with a group of women who were made to go out on a chain gang wearing T-shirts saying I was a drug addict while members of the public mocked them and jeered at them. They're made to dig graves and do other kind of degrading tasks. And then they're taken back to a prison that just consists of tents in the blistering Arizona desert heat. And there were moments where you were just like, staggered at what you were witnessing and 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 then it's supposedly kind of in a civilized country i mean in a, the richest country on earth and you have people treated like animals you know, it's a, that chapter was particularly disturbing because of the the arbitrariness of the of the punishment and the trivialness of the of the crimes it got these women eventually killing themselves sometimes yeah yeah i mean one of them uh, i'm really haunted by one of the women who, who died in, in horrific circumstances there um and I think it was particularly painful because of the contrast, right? So I would go to these places where, you know, Arizona being one of many examples where people who use drugs were being just monstrously brutalized in the name of cur- curing their addiction. In fact, obviously, it made their addictions much worse. And then I would go, and I've tried to remember which sequence I did it in. I think I went to Arizona first. But the pain of knowing, so then when I went to Portugal, where they had decriminalised all drugs and for reasons I'm sure we'll get to, massively reduced all the problems surrounding drugs. They haven't completely ended them, of course, but massively reduced them. And just thinking about those women in Arizona and thinking, God, this that, that those women who were brutalised and in one case burned to death in a, in a prison um, would, if they'd been in Portugal, would have been given love, support and a subsidised job, right? The, the, the contrast to me was just so stunning to to, to to see the catastrophe of the drug war and then to see that there are alternatives that work incredibly well. That contrast was one of the most painful and jarring things about the whole journey. I just wanted to go back to Arizona and the other prisons I went to in the US and other parts of the world like Vietnam and just take those people with me to Portugal or to Switzerland or to the places that had had chosen sane policies. Now I can imagine you've, you've sort of seen the, the light but most others haven't and why do you think that is? I mean, it's not as though, I mean, your book's very, it's one of the nice things about your book, it's very, it's easy to read. I mean, even the, the head of the police in Arizona would understand it, I would have thought. <laughs> Why aren't they interested in the truth? It's interesting, isn't it? I, I, one of the things I think about a lot is what actually changes people's minds? What, what works to change people's minds? And I was really taught that by the people I got to know on the journey for the book. I think a lot about one of the people I got to know who is one of the people I loved most, one of the most admirable people I've ever met, actually, was a guy called Bud Osborne. So in in the year 2000, but before I met him, obviously, 
Bud was living as a homeless street addict in Van- in the downtown east side of Vancouver, which I, you've been to the downtown east side. Yeah, 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 no, yes, yeah, yeah. yeah. So for people who don't know it, it's a um, part, a kind of notorious part of Vancouver that has a lot of poverty and chaotic street use. And Bud, at that time, the police were really cracking down hard on the downtown east side. And Bud was just watching his friends die all around him. And Bud thought, I can't just carry on watching this. I can't just carry on like this. But he also thought, as he would have put it, these these were obviously terms I would use. He said, you know, I'm just a homeless junkie. What am I going to do? And one day, Bud had an idea, a really simple idea. He just found out that one of his close friends, Margaret, had died. And he said, okay, I know what we'll do. He gathered together a group of the other homeless people with addiction problems. And he said, I've got an idea. Because of the crackdown, what would happen is people would go and hide in order to shoot up. So you'd hide behind dumpsters or in abandoned places. But obviously, if you're hiding and you start to overdose, you just die, right? So Bud had this idea. He said, well, when we're not using, which is most of the time, even for, you know, quite hardcore addicts, why don't we just drop a timetable and we'll go and look in the places where people shoot up And if we see someone overdosing, we'll call an ambulance. So just us, no officials, no funding from the government, nothing like that. We'll just do this ourselves, right? And people were a bit sceptical. There'd been many plans over the years to kind of rescue the downtown east side. But people liked Bud. So they said, okay, we'll try it. And they started doing it. And in the weeks and months that followed, the death toll on the downtown east side really significantly fell. And that meant that the people, you know, who were doing it, Well, firstly, it meant that people who would have died were in fact getting to live, which was in itself extraordinary. But it also meant that the people who were doing it, the homeless street users, started saying, you know, maybe we're not the pieces of shit everyone says we are. Maybe we can do something, right? So like, what could we do? So they set up a group called the Vancouver Area Network of Drug Users, VANDU, which still exists and does amazing work. And they were like, well, what could we campaign for? What would work? So Bud went to the library. There's quite a big library on the downtown east side. And he started reading about drug policy. He hadn't read about it before much. And he learned that in Frankfurt, in Germany, they had opened a safe injection site more than a decade before and had massively reduced deaths from overdose in Frankfurt. So Bud was like, okay, we'll we'll campaign for that here, right? There had been nothing like that in North America since 70 years before when the drug war began in earnest. But he was like, okay, we'll persuade, we'll persuade our mayor, right? The mayor of Vancouver at the time was a man named Philip Owen, who I got to know, who was a kind of, how would you describe Philip Owen? He was a rich guy from a very rich family who'd never known anyone with any any drug problems, right? He was a right winger. He wasn't the worst kind of right winger. He wasn't a Trump kind of person, but he was like a kind of Mitt Romney figure, you know. And Philip Owen had run on off for office as mayor, saying all the local drug addicts should be taken and detained at the local military base in Chilliwack and never let out. Right, so he'd run on a harsh drug war policy. But the people Van Du and the Bud and They were like, okay, we'll persuade him. So (laughs) they developed a quite confrontational tactic. They built a coffin. uh, And everywhere Philip Owen went, they followed him carrying this (laughs) coffin. And it said, had written on the coffin something like, who will die next, Philip Owen, before you open a safe injection site? And every time Philip Owen ever spoke in public, he was followed by a group of drug users. And the first question would always be, who will die next, Philip Owen, before you open a safe injection site? One time, Dean Wilson, who's one of the great people in Van Du, set, stood up and said, do you remember the woman who asked you a few months ago, who will die next, Philip Owen, before you so open a safe injection site? It turned out to be her, because you haven't done it yet. This went on for years, and people started to get a bit disheartened. And then one day, entirely to his credit, Philip Owen said, who the fuck are these people? <laughs> what is this, right? And he went and met with a load of the drug users, right? He spent a load of time on the downtown east side talking to people and it blew his mind, right? He didn't know anything about drug use. He he thought they were all just like people who party too hard and that's what happened to them. And he went to meet Milton Friedman, the Nobel Prize winning economist, who actually was a terrible person in many ways, but but was very good on our issue. He, he'd grown up in Chicago under prohibition, alcohol prohibition. And Milton Friedman explained drug policy to Philip Owen. And Philip Owen came back to the downtown east side and he held a press conference. And he had with him the chief of police, the coroner, and a representative of the drug addicts. And he said, I'm never going to talk about addiction again without having these guys here with me. They understand much better than we do. And he said, we are going to open 
the first safe injection site in North America. We're going to have the most compassionate drug policies in North America. Things are going to change around here. Just you wait and see. And Philip Owen's right-wing party was so horrified, they deselected him as their candidate and his career ended. But he was beaten by a more kind of progressive candidate who went ahead with it and they opened the safe injection site. And as a result, there was an 80% fall in deaths on the downtown east side. And there was a increase in average life expectancy of 10 years. I mean, you don't get figures like that very often. You know much better than I do. And I remember I went to go and see Philip Owen and he told me he would sacrifice his entire political career all over again for this, right? He said, what's the, how often in life do you get to save the lives of thousands of vulnerable people? You know, and I remember obviously spending a lot of time people who were involved in this and particularly with Bud Osborne. There was an appeal against this by Stephen Harper's right-wing government. It went all the way to the Canadian Supreme Court to shut down the injection site. And the Canadian Supreme Court ruled that people with addiction problems have a right to life, which means they have a right to a safe injection space, which means that will never be shut down now. And Bud, after I met him, about two years after I met him, Bud died. The guy who'd started all this, he was only in his early 60s, but he'd been a homeless addict during a drug war. It had really taken a toll on him. And when Bud died, they shut down the downtown east side where he had lived as a homeless person. And they had this incredible memorial service for him. And I remember when that happened and all the people who spoke, you know, there were lots of people in that crowd who knew that they were alive because of what Bud had started and so many other people had joined joined this movement and people had opened their hearts and they'd really listened. And I remember thinking, you know, when you get disheartened about this, we're in a big fight, we're up against very powerful forces. I think about Bud and I think it's hard to imagine a more powerless person in our culture than a homeless person with addiction problems, right? Bud didn't sit there thinking, oh, this is going to be too hard, right? He didn't give up. He didn't wait for someone else to do it. He started in the place where he stood and he appealed to the people around him and they appealed to other people around them and they built this this, this incredible movement that succeeded in the most extraordinary way and has saved an untold number of people's lives, although there are still, of course, huge challenges on the downtown east side. And and, and to me, that's, that, that's such a model. And I think for me, the, the reason the book's message has resonated is because I got to meet people like Bud Osborne, because I got to meet people like, you know, the, the people who told me the story of how Billie Holiday was stalked and killed by the war on drugs and yet fought and fought and fought. So to me, the, the power of the book is in the power of the extraordinary people who told me their stories all over the world. Absolutely. And, and, and those stories are well, from the very famous, like Billie Holiday, right, to the completely unknown, you know, the Mexican woman whose daughters disappeared, etc. But just sticking with the Vancouver experience, why would, why would the Premier of Canada want to oppose something that was so self-evidently good? Was that because they were being told to by America or was that because they just completely ignorant? I mean, Harper's not a stupid man. I, mean, I think it's for exactly the reasons that Jackie Smith responded to you, the Home Secretary at the time, who was a Labour Home Secretary, responded to you, right? So in terms of why politicians, and it's not just politicians of the right, although they tend to be a little bit worse, in terms of why politicians are so bad on this, I think there's lots of reasons and politicians have believed the same myths and delusions that the general societies believe. But to me, I think it, it comes down to a really pretty simple thing. If you're a politician... You're constantly making a calculation. If I do X, how much praise will I get and how much shit will I get? And at the moment, if you do the right thing on drug policy, you'll get a little bit of praise and you'll get a lot of shit. And so they they do the wrong thing, right? But that calculation can be totally changed. And for me, this is very informed by just being, I'm 41 years old and I'm gay. And I have seen the transformation of that debate in ways that I could not have conceived of when I was like a young teenager realising I was gay. I mean, I remember when I was, I don't know how old I would have been, maybe eight or nine and sort of realising I was gay but not really having a vocabulary for it and seeing the front page of of The Sun the day there was the first ever gay kiss on British television and EastEnders and the front page was, it's EastEnders, right? That was the front page of The Sun. Now, that was, that's like, I'm not, that's not that long ago, right? Now, if the craziest UKIP counsellor tweeted it's EastEnders after a gay kiss on EastEnders, they would have to resign, right? So the fact that the political calculus at the moment for people like Harper, and actually it's been a huge transformation in Canada, as you know, and they've now fully legalised cannabis and have much more compassionate policies 
across the board, the political calculus can be changed and it can only be changed by people within the society. It's not going to change because politicians at the top. Sometimes you'll get nice and decent politicians. Sometimes you'll get monstrous and wicked politicians. Rebecca Solnit, the American writer, puts it really well. Politicians are the weather vane and it's our job to be the weather, right? <laughs> and particularly on our, on our topic, you know, it's really interesting. If you look at a public opinion and the polling of it in some detail, huge majorities of people, it's been better studied in the US because there's just more study of it, opinion. But huge majorities, more than 80% of Americans agree with the statement, the war on drugs has failed, right? Done work. And huge majorities agree with, with that it will never work, right? And they're quite right. The US has done this for 100 years. They've spent a trillion dollars. They've imprisoned millions of their own citizens. They've killed hundreds of thousands of people at a conservative estimate. They've destroyed whole countries like Colombia and El Salvador. And at the end of all that, they can't even keep drugs out of their prisons, right? It gives you some sense of how well that'll work. But, but what's interesting, where it begins to break down public opinion is when you talk about the alternatives. And that's because people have a very distorted sense of what the alternatives are and what they mean. In terms of our campaigning energy, I think there's lots of things we need to do. We need to expose the racism of this, particularly in Britain, by the way, extraordinarily racist drug policies we have in Britain. We have to radically change the way we think about what causes addiction and what solves it. There's a whole range of things. But for me, the most important part of it is about explaining what the alternatives are actually mean in practice to people and not in an abstract way because very often when you do decriminalization legalization people say well what would that mean and they get into this kind of theoretical debate and i want to go no 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 this isn't a theoretical debate let me tell you about portugal let me tell you about switzerland let me tell you about canada and uruguay you know it's not a theoretical debate it's a very practical one uh, that has been tried does that make sense to you david does that ring true to you well, yeah. It, it, well, I sense that politicians won't go willingly, and and you know that that, that example of basically shaming uh, the, the the mayor of, of um, Vancouver to do something is a, is a brilliant one. But we need the media on side as well, don't we? And I think drugs, almost in a way, are the last vestige where the media can have someone to hate. You know, as you say, you know, in your in my lifetime, we've gone. You know, certainly we've had um, homosexuality made legal. We've had abortion made legal. You know, we've actually had attempted suicide made legal in the 50s it was illegal even to you know to try to kill you so you know we've seen major major changes and the only one that really hasn't happened is drugs and i i, I kind of wonder why that is and i think maybe it's you know it's a sort of the last stand you know the alamo you know people don't want to get you know otherwise what what would what would right-wing newspapers go on about we'll get back to the interview in just a second i just want to thank all the drug science community members for your continued support Without you, the dissemination of information like this would not be possible. Drug science is, and always will be, independent. This means we don't accept sponsorships. But by becoming a drug science community member, you'll be helping us bring about change. You'll also receive access to exclusive events and will be able to attend all drug science events for free. To see how to become a community member, click on the link in the show notes. Now, where were we? Let's get back to the show. I think that's really interesting. And I think, you know, in terms of diffusing the right wing opposition to the alternatives, I think it's really worth thinking about Switzerland and what they did there, because this is a really powerful model of that. I mean, I spent a lot of time in Switzerland researching this, but also my dad is from Switzerland. That's why I have this weird name. And Switzerland is a really important example because it's a country that got to really substantial drug policy reform, despite being very conservative. I mean, my Swiss relatives make Donald Trump look like Oprah, right? This is a really right-wing country. And yet they have effectively legalised heroin for people with addiction problems. And the story of how they did it is really important, I think, for, for thinking about what, what you've just brought up. So again, in the year 2000, Switzerland had just a catastrophic uh, heroin problem. People will remember scenes from the news of, you know, people in, in parks in Zurich and Bern and Geneva kind of, you know, injecting in the neck in public, really, really uh, disturbing scenes. And the Swiss reaction initially in the run up to the year 2000 was basically, you know, uh, somewhat American style punitive shaming, right? Uh, arresting, harassing people. They didn't have mass incarceration, but apart from that, significant police harassment and aggression against people with addiction problems. And it, it just failed and failed and failed. And then Switzerland got first as a health minister and then as its first ever female president. 
really remarkable woman named Ruth Dreyfus, who I got to know in the writing of the book. She's my candidate for president of the world. I love Ruth. I go for her. <laughs> oh, I love her. You should have her on your podcast. Um, she's such a great person. That's an excellent idea. What happened is uh, Ruth would stress that she was also pressed by people within the civil society and organizations that were defending the rights of people there, which is true. But what happened is, problem gotten so acute, Ruth explained to Swiss people, she said to them, I think the solution to that problem is to legalize heroin. And she said, I know when you first hear that, you're going to think it's crazy. Because when you hear the word legalization, what you picture is anarchy and chaos. But she explained, what we have now is anarchy and anarchy. chaos. Yes, yes. We have unknown criminals selling unknown chemicals to unknown drug users, all in the dark, all filled with violence, disease and, 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 and chaos. She said, legalization is the way we restore all order to this chaos, right? Switzerland is a very order-based society. It's not a coincidence they invented clocks, right? Yes. They are obsessed <laughs> with order. So this disorder was horrendous to them. So what she did is she took those conservative arguments and conservative instincts. She said, those instincts are right. And this policy is thwarting those instincts, right? Which is a very important way of talking. And she used authority figures like Police officers, I know you, I loved your conversation with Neil Woods, who's a total hero, British police officer who's speaking about the drug war in amazing ways. So Ruth's emphasis was to take a conservative argument. So they legalised heroin for people with addiction problems. Um, if you have a heroin addiction in Switzerland, you have a range of options, but one of them is that you're assigned, you can be assigned to a clinic. Um, I went, spent some time in the one in Geneva. Uh, by the way, Ruth, the former president, lives opposite this clinic. I think that tells you something. So if you're assigned to the clinic, you turn up at seven o'clock in the morning because Swiss people believe in doing things insanely early. You turn up, you're given your heroin there. It's medically pure heroin. You can't take it out with you because they don't want you to resell it. You use it there. You either shoot up or they'll help you. And then you leave and you go to your job because they give you loads of help and support to get work, housing, therapy. And there's loads of fascinating things that have emerged from this Swiss experiment. When I went there, it'd been in place for nearly 15 years. Since they legalized heroin in Switzerland, there have been no heroin overdose deaths in the legal program. That's zero, not one person. And there's been an enormous fall of deaths from prohibited heroin because who wants to buy shitty street heroin when you can go to the clinic and be given it uh, much better heroin for free? So massive improvement in, in every measurable outcome, whether it's people getting to live, people becoming employed, massive fall in street crime, uh, massive fall in costs. This is much cheaper than harassing people with the police, trying them and imprisoning them. Um, and, and I can talk about other aspects of the Swiss experiment that surprise me if you like, but, but perhaps the most important for purposes of what we're talking about, which is persuasion and how we win the argument, Switzerland then had a referendum on whether to keep this programme after it had been in place for several years. And in Switzerland, they voted by 70% to keep heroin legal. Again, not because they're so compassionate, right? I'd love to tell you that Swiss people won the argument for compassion. They didn't. Actually, it was a much more basic thing. It was we restored order. People could see. There was no one shooting up in the parks anymore. There was no street prostitution anymore. Uh, there was no one dying around you anymore, right? And it's not perfect. They still got problems in Switzerland, of course, but it's, uh, there was no street dealing anymore when it came to heroin. And there's a very good for people who want to think more about the politics of how we communicate that. Obviously, I write about it in the book, but it's also a very good... Joanne Set C-S-E-T-E, -E, did a very good pamphlet for the Open Society Foundations. It's called From the Mountaintops. You can read it for free online, which goes through the specific political mess messaging around uh, drug policy reform. And to me, I think this is really important because for several reasons. We're increasingly winning the argument with people on the left and liberals, um, and that's great, and that's my side of politics, so it's much more congenial to me, obviously. But actually, people we need to win over now are independents, conservatives, and right-wingers. And these arguments are really important, and they work. I mean, I am the only person who's ever gone on a Fox News program and got the host, their top-rated host, Tucker Carlson, to say that he's in favour of decriminalising all drugs, right? And it's precisely by using these conservative arguments. Again, does that does that ring true to you, David? Does that sound well, right I think, to you? I think we need you um, campaigning more here, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think Neil is a wonderful, and people who haven't read Neil's fantastic book, Good Cop, Bad War, and his more recent one, which is also excellent. Um, I really recommend it. I think one of the lessons of the Swiss, ex the Swiss experiment in reform was the most effective people for communicating on this are conservative authority figures. So one of the most 
moving experiences I've had since the book came out is after it'd been out for a few years, I was contacted by a Republican state senator in Mississippi who said, I read your book and I'm using it to make the case for reform. And I got in contact by him and his family. His sister is called Christina Dent, who's a really extraordinary person. So Christina is an evangelical Christian in Mississippi who is so passionately against abortion that she fosters children. And as you, you know, I'm a left-wing gay atheist, right? We're at the opposite ends of the spectrum, you would think. And Christina fosters kids. And if you foster kids in Mississippi, most people who have their kids taken away from them in Mississippi are people with addiction problems. And Christina, who's a really one of the most admirable people I know, she was just struck. Why did no one help these women years ago? They wouldn't have got to the point where their children were having their babies taken away from them. So she learned all about drug policy. She started using my book to, and, and so now like hundreds and hundreds of conservative evangelical Christians in Mississippi have read my book. And it's this fascinating thing. And, and Christina's always sending me the things they write in, in response to it. It was a real education for me, actually, in prejudice, because if I think about, it comes back to Vancouver, you know, Philip Owen, the conservative mayor of Vancouver, was the most unlikely person to be persuaded, right? He literally run for office saying that they should all be locked up in the local military base, the addicts. And yet, Philip Owen, what a class act. You know, I got to know Philip Owen. One of the things I really learned from this, just like a key part of what we're saying is never write off people with addiction problems, never write off anyone. You never know who's going to open their heart. You never know who's going to be persuaded. It might be the most unlikely people who are won over by this. And actually in Britain, there's been some really, again, I stress, you know, my politics are very much anti-Tory. You know, there's been some quite good Tory MPs who've been speaking out on our issues lately. You just don't know, right? I mean, it's Labour people are better and Lib Dems and the Greens are perfect on this stuff as far as I'm concerned. But, but you know, you just never know who you're going to win over. Mm. Yeah, actually, interesting. I've I have just yesterday recorded a podcast with uh, Crispin Blunt, who is very much a sort of pioneer of uh, rational policies uh, in Parliament. I mean, it, but he obviously doesn't have much authority at present, but at least he is he's voicing the decriminalisation uh, and the economic arguments. I totally agree. Massive credit to him. I remember when the obviously COVID nineteen has reduced it to some degree, but when there was, you know, we've had a lot of stabbings in in London, particularly of teenagers. Crispin Blunt is absolutely right to point out. Of course, there's many things going on, and this certainly doesn't describe all of the stabbings that are going on. But a lot of this is prohibition-related violence, right? So, so if we if we think about, and it's interesting, I think the prohibition-related violence thing is something that has to be slightly unpacked. Obviously, not for your listeners, but I, I've been trying to think about the ways in which we can unpack it and explain it to people, especially since it's playing out so much on British streets. The way I found that I think does communicate it to people is okay. So I say to people, imagine trying to steal a bottle of vodka. Imagine you went now and tried to steal a bottle of vodka. If the shop that sells it catches you, they're going to ring the police and the police will come and take you away. So that shop doesn't need to be violent. It doesn't need to be intimidating. They've got the power of the law to uphold their property rights. Okay, now imagine you want to steal a bag of cannabis or a bag of ecstasy or a bag of cocaine, right? Obviously, the guys who sell that in your neighborhood, and there certainly will be someone selling it in your neighborhood, those guys can't call the police. The police would come and arrest you. So they have to fight you. Now, if you're a dealer, you don't want to be having a fight every day. So you want to establish a reputation for being such a badass that no one's going to fuck with you, right? The, the war on drugs creates a war for drugs, as Charles Bowden put it, right? And if you want to know how much of that, and that's of course what we, a large part, not all, but a large part of what we're seeing play out. These are kids fighting to control uh, drug distribution routes, right? And to have a reputation for being so frightening that you won't try and fuck with my drug trade, right? The French sociologist Philippe Bourgeois says that prohibition creates a culture of terror because you've got no recourse to the law. You have to create a culture of terror. You have to be frightening, right? And if you want to know how much of that violence is caused by prohibition, just to ask yourself, where are the violent alcohol dealers? You know, does the head of Smirnoff go and shoot the head of Heineken in the face? No, of course not. But exactly that happened under alcohol prohibition. And it ended the day alcohol was was legalized, right? I mean, uh, one of the most fascinating people who's read my book, who I spent time with in Buenos Aires, was um, uh, Sebastian Marroquin, who is better known by his the name he used to have, which was Pablo Escobar Jr., and I remember Sebastian, who you should also have on your podcast, what a what an intelligent and thoughtful person he is. But I remember him saying to me, you know, the only thing my father ever truly feared was the legalization of drugs. <laughs> if, if drugs had been legal, my dad would have been a used car salesman mm -hmm. and you would have never heard of him. 
right? And it, I remember him saying this to me. It was a really weird experience because first time we met, it was in a. He said, "Oh, come and meet me. There's a Burger King near where I live." So I go to this Burger King in, in suburban Buenos Aires. And it was empty except for me. So I'm sort of sitting in the kind of, he said, meet me in the corner. So it was just by the kind of soft um, play, you know, where those, those balls that all kids yeah, jump yeah. into. Yeah. So sort of sitting there in this Burger King in the, what seems to be the end of the world, middle of the world. And he walks in and he looks so much like his dad. <laughs> and it was just such a surreal, like it was like a weird stress dream where you're at a Burger King and Pablo Escobar comes in. But he's a really remarkable person. And, and again, you think about that dynamic that plays out on the streets of London, that war for drugs is catastrophic enough on the streets of London. When it takes over whole cities, like in Ciudad Juarez, where I spent time in, in northern Mexico, it's it's unimaginably terrible. This is the single biggest cause of death in the world that we could simply end. Absolutely. Right? One of the things I find, what, what's great about your book is that you go into the history and and the history of alcohol prohibition and, and Harry Anslinger is, is fascinating, not only because it sort of it is the origin, it's, it's this kind of the beginnings of the war on drugs with his reformulating cannabis as a dangerous drug to keep his army going, but also the fact that no one's learned the lesson. <laughs> Every, well, everyone says you know, the war on alcohol prohibition was a disaster. And then you say, well, so why, would, why do we carry on pro- prohibiting other drugs? And, and politicians just don't look away. They, they glaze over and they, 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 they seem to be happy to have this kind of complete paradox in their head that alcohol prohibition doesn't work, every other prohibition does. And a lot of that has got to be down to Anslinger and his, you know, creating the model that we still live by to today. So tell people about him. I'm not sure everyone knows quite how detrimental his legacy has been. Well, there's a line that Harry Anslinger said. Harry Anslinger is the government bureaucrat who was the first person to ever use the phrase war on drugs in the 1930s. He effectively invented the modern war on drugs. But there's a line Harry Anslinger said that I thought of you in relation to, David. In, in 1946, he was at the UN, at the new United Nations, and they were the US was effectively forcing every country in the world to ban drugs using its new regnant power at the end of the Second World War. And the government of Thailand, uh, representatives of the government of Thailand said, well, we don't, we don't want to do that. It hasn't worked in your country. It won't work in ours. You know, they'd had legal opium for forever, right? And Harry Anslinger, this is an exact quote, said to them, I've made up my mind. Don't try to confuse me with the facts. <laughs> and I thought that's effectively what Jackie Smith said to you yeah, when she was absolutely. firing you, right? It's uh, like, absolutely. I've made up my mind. Don't try to confuse me with the facts. It, that's the slogan for the drug war. But, but to explain about Harry Anslinger, Insofar as I thought about it at all, before I did the research for Chasing the Scream, I thought, if you'd asked me, well, okay, why were drugs banned? I would have thought it was for basically the reasons that an average person would give on the street today. If you said to them, why are drugs banned? They'd probably say, well, we don't want kids to use drugs. We don't want people to become addicted. Now, they're wrong that the drug war achieves those goals, but I think that's the reasons they would give. What was fascinating going back was to realise that stuff barely came up when they were banning drugs, right? In fact, it, it, almost never. You look at, read the transcripts, go through, I went through Harry Anslinger's archives in great detail at the University of Pennsylvania. So Harry Anslinger was a government bureaucrat and he took over the Department of Prohibition just as alcohol prohibition is ending. So he's got this big government department that's very soon going to have nothing to do. In fact, has been discredited. The war on alcohol has been, of course, a disaster. And Harry Anslinger invented the modern war on drugs to keep his department going. Now, he absolutely sincerely believed in it as well. It's important to stress it wasn't a purely cynical in that sense. But he built the war on drugs around two intense hatreds that he had. One was an intense hatred of African-Americans and Latinos. I mean, he was so racist that he was regarded as a crazy racist in the 1920s, right? Oh, his own well. senator said he should have to resign because he used the N-word so often in official memos. And the other group he intensely hated was people with addiction problems. The farm he'd grown up on in Altoona in Pennsylvania, there was a woman, a farmer's wife with an addiction problem who he was terrified of and obsessed by, who, who lived nearby, and she had an addiction problem. So he builds this modern drug war. And obviously, we think about the, a lot of about this again over the last year because we've just made a, a movie that's coming out in November which is about this story it's been directed by Lee Daniels who directed Precious and The Butler and loads of other great films it's re- I'm really thrilled actually I think it's come out really well the film so I open the book with this moment and I think sometimes people think why is the book about the drug war starting like this and then it becomes clear this moment in 1939 Billie Holiday walked onto a stage in a hotel in midtown Manhattan they didn't even let her go through the front door because she was African-American. They made her go through the service elevator. And she sang a song called Strange Fruit. I'm sure a lot of your listeners know it's a song against lynching. Not everyone knows that. You know, no, yeah, so it's, it's a song against lynching. It's, it's this idea that in the South, there's a strange fruit that hangs from the trees. 
And as the song goes on, you realise it's the mutilated bodies of African-American men who've been lynched. And that night, after she sang that song, Billie Holiday got a warning from the agents of this man, Harry Anslinger. And the warning effectively said, stop singing this song. You might think, why would it begin there, right? But I think it tells you so much about the drug war. And then what happened next tells you even more. So Billie Holiday said, effectively, fuck you. I'm an American citizen. I'll sing what I damn well please. And at that point, Harry Anslinger resolved to destroy her. So he hated employing African-American agents, but you couldn't really send a white guy to follow Mm -hmm. Billie Holiday around Harlem for for a year. It'd be a bit obvious. So he employed an African-American agent named Jimmy Fletcher. And he said to him, look, follow Billie Holiday everywhere she goes, track her, document her drug use. We're going to bust her. We're actually going to bust all these jazz singers. He thought jazz was this evil, as he put it, primitive African music that was hypnotizing white people into the create. And of course, the worst nightmare was the creation of mixed race babies. That was his, or that mixed race isn't, I won't use the word he used, but it wasn't mixed race. Um, so Jimmy Fletcher follows Billie Holiday around for, for more than a year. And Billie Holiday was so amazing that Jimmy Fletcher fell in love with her. And his whole life, he felt ashamed of what he did next. He arrests her. She's busted. She's put on trial. The trial was called the United States versus Billie Holiday. She said that's how it fucking felt. (laughs) She's put in prison for 18 months and then she's released. But what happened next is the cruelest thing. So she's released. But to perform anywhere where alcohol was served in, in most states, you needed what was called a cabaret performer's license. And Anslinger makes sure she's not given this license. Yeah, the, she's denied yeah. it. So as uh, Billy's friend Yolanda Bavan said to me, what's the cruelest thing you can do to a person? It's to take away the thing they love, right? This, by the way, is what we do to people with addiction problems all over the world today, right? With a few exceptions like Portugal and Switzerland. We give them criminal records. We put barriers between them and reconnecting with a healthy, fulfilling life. In that situation, entirely predictably, Billy Holiday relapses, in fact, she'd been raped. She'd been what's called a child prostitute, i.e. she had been raped by strangers as a child for money more times than anyone can count. She was dealing with horrific, almost unimaginably horrific childhood trauma. She goes back to very severe heroin addiction and alcoholism. One day in the mid-50s, she collapses in midtown Manhattan, not very far from where she first performed Strange Fruit, actually. She's taken to a hospital. First hospital won't even let her in. Second hospital lets her in. And... She says to her friend, Maylie Dufty, on the way in, that Anslinger's men haven't finished with her. She said, they're going to kill me in there. Don't let them. She wasn't wrong. So in the hospital, she's diagnosed with advanced um, liver cancer. And she's really unwell. Anslinger's men come. They they handcuff her to the hospital bed. They arrest her on her hospital bed. They don't let her friends in to see her. And she goes into withdrawal because they're not, she can't get any heroin there, obviously. Maylie Dufty managed to, her friend managed to insist that she was given methadone and she began to recover. Ten days later, Anslinger's agents cut off her methadone and she died the next day. One of her friends told the BBC, it looked like she had been violently wrenched from life, right? And to me, Billy Holiday's story is, is so important and I'm really glad it's going to hopefully reach a bigger audience through this film because, well, firstly, it tells us what the drug war was about all along. Right? It was about racism. It was about persecuting people with addiction problems. It was about keeping government bureaucracies going. It was about cracking down on the people the society wants to crack down on for other reasons, right? Other ugly, disreputable reasons. But to me, and this comes right back to where we started about why I wrote the book, because we had addiction in my family. For me, there was an even more powerful lesson there, which was Billie Holiday never stopped singing that song right? She would go to the worst parts of the Deep South where you didn't need a license and she would perform her song. Even when people threw fucking bottles at her, she sang her song, right? To me, you know, there's only one story we tell in our culture that's heroic about people with addiction problems, which is that sometimes they stop being addicted, right? They recover. That is indeed a heroic story. Anyone listening in that situation should be massively given love and congratulations. But, you know, Billie Holiday never stopped being addicted, right? She was addicted to the day she died. She was still a hero. She was still an extraordinary human being. And I remember thinking, you know, all over the world, every day, people listen to Billie Holiday's songs and it makes them stronger. And all over the world every day, we still follow the script, with a few exceptions like Switzerland and Portugal, we still follow the script laid down by Harry Anslinger and it makes people weaker and sicker, just like it did to, to Billie Holiday. I remember y- Yolanda Bavan, who's her friend, Billy was Billie's friend, I interviewed all the kind of people who were still around who'd known Billie Holiday, including a great man named Reverend Eugene Callender, who was actually in the room when she was 
being effectively killed and led protests outside the hospital that said he had signs that said her nickname was Lady Day. He said, let Lady live with the signs they held up. They knew what was happening. There was nearly riots actually outside the hospital because people were so incensed by what they were doing. It wasn't hidden. But yeah, Yolanda said to me one time, I said to her, this is always a good, uh, any journalist listening, it's always a good question to ask. I said to her, what would you say to Billie Holiday if you could talk to her now? And she'd been telling me how towards the end of her life, Billie Holiday thought that Anslinger's men had not just, were not just killing her, but were, had effectively wiped her from the record that she wouldn't be remembered. And Yolanda said, I would say to her, Billie, this morning I went into a branch of Whole Foods and they were playing your songs. <laughs> Nobody forgot you, baby. And to me, that story of endurance, it really helped me, although it's, it's you know, look, it's a on, constant ongoing struggle if you've got someone you love who's got an addiction problem and it's actually in quite a bad, um, one of the people I love is in quite a bad way at the moment. And it's a constant struggle. And we all have a Harry Anslinger in our heads that says, why doesn't someone just stop you and feels angry? And these are not, you know, these are, these are human responses, but we don't have to have policies that destroy people. We can have policies that heal people. That was why it was the introduction to your book, because I think a lot of people listen to Billie Holloway, but not all of them know how she... I didn't I didn't know she was killed by Anslinger. I, I thought she died because she was a heroin addict. I didn't realise it. It's interesting. It was kind of unknown, David. I remember having... I mean, it wasn't totally unknown. There were aspects of the story that were out there, but they hadn't been all brought together. And I remember, it was, again, a real journalistic reminder for me. So my attitude is, when you're investigating a story, phone absolutely everyone and go meet absolutely everyone because you just never know. And I remember... I almost didn't contact Billie Holiday's godchildren because they were like very young when she died. They were like all below the age of 10. But I thought, oh, I'll phone them just to see. And I phoned Bevan Dufty, who uh, was a godson. He's in San Francisco now. He was on the, the city council in San Francisco, actually. And he ran for mayor. And, and, and I was talking to Bevan and he was telling me all sorts of interesting things. And then he said, because I'd noticed that Billie Holiday comes up a lot in Harry Anslinger's archives. And he said, well, you know, my mother, who was her best friend, basically thought that he killed Billie Holiday. And I said, oh, tell me more about that. And he started telling me more. It's telling me all this interesting detail. And I said, well, how do you, how do you know all this, Bevan? And he said, well, my mother wrote this memoir. And I said, did she? I haven't found it. He said, it was never published. And I said, and he said, well, I've got it in my attic. Do you want it? And I was like, uh, yeah. <laughs> and so that was the kind of one of the key moments that I was able to disentangle what had happened. Uh, and, and obviously from there, I had then got lots of leads based on what she had written and then what was in the Anslinger archives and what was already in the public domain, like a wonderful biography of Billie Holiday by uh, Julia Blackburn and and another good one by Donald Walker. And so it went from there. It's very moving watching the film because I'm being involved with it because I do feel in some way, maybe this is a really kind of grandiose <laughs> thing to say, but I feel like in some, we can't undo this terrible thing that was done to her, but I feel like in some way we've sort of avenged her. You know, like that story is out there now. It'll never be put back in the box. And especially at a moment when this is a story, of course, of an African-American being murdered by the police, right? We're obviously thinking about that a lot at the moment, quite rightly. We should have been thinking about it ever since then. And indeed, a long time before Billy Holiday was murdered, we should have been talking about that and opposing it. But so, yeah, to, to me, the, the racism is one. It's really worth us as British people thinking about there is one country in the world that has a worse racial disparity than the United States when it comes to drug arrests. And it's and us. us. Yeah, exactly. Right? That yeah. is, that, this should be a national scandal. And again, another really important moment in getting making the case for reform, particularly at this moment of renewed consciousness and activism, quite rightly around these issues of racism in our country. Um, and I was really inspired to see the stature of depraved slave owner, a slave, you know, profiteer from slavery being torn down in, in Bristol. You know, one of the primary tools through which racism is enforced in Britain is the, is the drug laws. And it was a key moment in the shifting of the debate in the US when the races, that, things like books like Michelle Alexander's excellent book, The New Jim Crow, we haven't had a British equivalent of that. And I'm keen, anyone listening who wants to begin that conversation, I'm really keen to, and I think obviously it should be led by black British people, the, the desire to spur that conversation. I'm really interested in how, thinking about how we can do that. Well, it's clearly necessary. I mean, we've, we're going to have to stop fairly soon, but I just want, you haven't mentioned the N-word, the Nixon word. and I mean, it seems to me that Anslinger started it, but Nixon ratcheted it up to a point where it, it's been absurd now and even more destructive than it would have been if he hadn't started his war on drugs in order to get you know, himself out. It, this is a difficult thing to say, 
but Rich Nixon is the devil, as far as I'm concerned. I mean, apart from the fact that he caused the death of three million people in Southeast Asia, he's an unimaginably wicked human being. Actually, if we want to be honest about people who massively stepped... Nixon did... Look, Nixon massively steps up the drug war in, in ways that were consciously and deliberately racist, as we know from uh, interviews that later emerged of people who worked for him, who literally, he, he literally regarded it as a way to incarcerate more African-Americans. But much more uncomfortable people like, it's easy for you and me to hate Richard Nixon, right? And, and right, the single president who most increased uh, incarceration of African-Americans using drug laws was Bill Clinton, right? And that's less congenial for us. We, you know, he's our side in inverted commas. But actually look at what Bill Clinton did with the drug drug laws. They were, it was absolutely monstrous. And, and the biggest increase in incarceration is under Reagan, another easy person for us to hate and a truly despicable person. But, but you know, this has been relatively bipartisan. I mean, and Barack Obama was somewhat better than, than what went before, to be sure. But the, this has been a, in both Britain and the US, this has been a relatively bipartisan, you know, in Britain that you've got your, Good people like Crispin Blunt in the Tory party. You, more people are good about this in Labour and, and certainly the Greens are excellent. And the Lib Dems actually uh, are excellent. And Nick Clegg, not someone I generally praise, was actually excellent on this issue. So, you know, we. But I think it's easy in a way for us to hate the right wingers who do it, but I don't want to let off everyone else. You know, it's a difficult one. Well, I know that because I was sacked by a, a, a Labour <laughs> <laughs> secretary. That's right where we first met. There you that's go. We're exactly. back to our there first night go. together, David, right? The, well, that's, uh... that's a good point to, to say thank <laughs> you very much. It's been a, a delightful hour. We've uh, overrun, oh. but that doesn't matter. I, wanna, I want to tell everyone who's listened that they must read the book, Chasing the Scream, best book on drugs and the, uh, and the history of the drug laws and the absurdity and the nastiness that there's ever been. And... Remind us again the title of the film that's coming out about Billie Holiday. It's called The United States versus Billie Holiday. Uh, I'm really sure it's coming out in November in the US. It'll probably be a little bit later in Britain, but the I'm assuming there are cinemas for it to open in, but, uh, which I'm, I'm not entirely confident about. But the um, and I should also say um, a lot of the people that we've talked about, uh, you can listen on the book's website for free to interviews with them, people like Ruth Dreyfus, uh, President of Switzerland, who led this. You can listen to people inside the clinics in Switzerland. You can listen to Billie Holiday's friends. You can listen to Hitmen in Mexico. <laughs> so it's chasingthescream.com. You can also find out on that website. You can take a quiz to see how much you know about the history of these things. You can see where to get the book, the ebook and the audio book. And you can see whether to, where to follow me on social media. Although I recently had this thing where, did you, have you ever had this, David, where... I did an interview and at the end they said, so what's your Twitter? What's your Facebook? What's your Instagram? And I said, oh, and then they said, what's your Snapchat? What's your TikTok? And I was like, I'm a 41 year old man. <laughs> <laughs> like, I'm not yeah. on Snapchat. What do you take me for? We take you for a pioneer. Thank you so much, Johan. <laughs> it's been a great interview and uh, keep up the good work. And I'm really looking uh, forward to the film. Oh, uh, well, thank you so much for the, uh, what you've done all over the world. You know, I just think about so many people who've talked to me about how your evidence has inspired them, has help them yeah and crazy mixtures of people actually so yeah I, i'm really grateful to you. you're such an important part of this fight and i i'm so proud to be in this fight with you and i'm so grateful to you for everything you've taught me on this subject well i hope you enjoyed that a remarkable amount of information and, and passion in johan and his book please do read the book chasing the screen look out for the film that's coming up about billy holiday against the usa and obviously, try to follow Drug Science. Try to follow me on Twitter, Drug Science on Twitter. And uh, if you've enjoyed the podcast, please sign up to become a member of our community. That allows you access to drug science activities, to meetings, lectures, etc. And your support will keep up the good work that Drug Science is doing, telling the truth about drugs. Thank you for listening. Thank you.